Welcome everyone. We are here with Dr. Jackson Katz and we're going to talk about the link between masculinity and mass shootings in the United States. Um, Jackson, it is wonderful to have you with us today and thank you for sitting down for this short conversation. Um, let's jump right in. Tell us about the link between masculinity and mass shootings. Well, thanks, Caroline. It's great to be with you and your colleagues at the Representation Project, and you do incredible work, and I'm just so happy to be uh, in long-term uh, partnership with you and your colleagues. Um, I think the central factor in school shootings and mass killings is, is gender and particularly masculinity. Um, it's, it's almost never talked about like that. Um, why do I say it's the central factor? Well, let's take school shootings. Over 99% of school shootings are done by young men and boys over 99%, and yet the mainstream conversation always focuses on the two pillars of, or poles of, on the one hand, mental illness and the need for better mental health treatment. On the other hand, um, availability of guns, especially high, uh, you know, uh, high powered military style assault weapons with high capacity magazines. And so the debate goes between, oh, is it mental illness or is it availability of guns? Meanwhile, over 99% of the shootings is done by boys and young men. And I often say that if it wasn't about gender, then why aren't girls 50% of the shooters? Because girls have every bit the mental health challenges the boys do, girls have every bit the access to guns that boys do, but they commit less than 1% of the shootings. And, and another way to think about that, you know, I mean, the, do a thought exercise to think about this is to say, imagine if 99% of school shootings was done by girls and young women, would anybody be talking about mental illness and guns in the first instance? Or would everybody be saying, what's going on with girls? And what is it about cultural you know, beliefs about femininity and femininities and the socialization of girls and the particular life circumstances that girls and young women find themselves in and the way that they're socialized to react to those situations? Wouldn't that be the first thing that everybody would be talking about? That's right. But when, because it's boys and young men who represent the dominant group in the, in the, the binary gender system, it, 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 it goes invisible, it goes unspoken. And then people will say, well, the reason why you don't say it out loud because it's because everybody knows it. Everybody knows that boys and young men are the ones doing it. But the, the point is that if you don't say it out loud, then you're not gonna have a discussion about the particularly gendered features of, of these problems. And you're gonna be missing a huge part of the problem. And that's what's been happening for over 20 years is that mainstream media coverage of school shootings rarely talks about the central gender issues in you know that are that are taking place and it's incredibly frustrating because there are people in the field feminists you know writers thinkers activists there are therapists and psychologists who have a, you know who are more coming at it from the psychotherapeutic angle in in terms of boys and men's emotional and psychological and trauma responses there's obviously there's sociologists and others looking at informed by feminist ideas, looking at the, the particularly gendered aspects of male socialization and a culture of a violent culture that we live in and a patriarchal culture that we live in. People have been looking at this and talking about it and thinking about it and theorizing about it and researching about it. But in terms of the mainstream conversation, we barely get any airtime to have these kinds of insights be discussed in a, in a mainstream way. Well, let's talk about that, Jackson. What is going on with boys? What are the mechanisms here? What is driving mass shootings and, and young men acting out in this way? Well, I think we have to be clear that school shootings are very rare events, even though they seem to be happening on a regular basis, which they do happen on a regular basis. But they're, they're unusual events also, because you know mo the vast and overwhelming majority of, uh, of boys and men, including who have deep problems, and deep psychological, emotional problems um, and access to guns, the, the overwhelming majority don't go near doing something as extreme as a school shooting. So I think it's important that, that, that we keep it in perspective. But, but by the way, violence of all kinds is a huge problem. Men's violence of all kinds, men's violence against women, men's violence against other men, you know, young men, you know, in, you know, in cities across the country, whether they're black, Latino, white, Asian, murdering each other, shooting each other, using guns to kill each other is a, is a daily phenomenon. I, I know we focus on these school shootings and these mass killing events, which we should, partly because they're so horrific and, um, and, and, they're, and therefore so newsworthy, but 
they're, they're also connected in many ways to all the other forms of violence that are, in, are mostly perpetrated by men and young men uh, against other young men, against women, against people who aren't men or women across the gender and sexual um, identity spectrum. The overwhelming majority of violence in our society is perpetrated by men. And the, and the question becomes, why is that? Is it, is it genetically um, predestined? You know, is it something at birth? Is there, is there some kind of wiring issue? I, I don't think so. I, I just don't, I think that th that's been completely refuted. Human behavior is not the result of some, you know, something reducible to some sort of biological chip in your brain. It's, it's, it's a complex set of factors. And the question is in, in our society at this time in 21st century, what are the factors that are producing so many men who act out violently, both towards, again, other men and boys, but also towards, you know, women, girls. And I have to say, Caroline, towards themselves, you know, what violence, excuse me, suicide is violence turned inward. And we have a big, huge problem of suicide in this country. In fact, two thirds of gun violence deaths every year in the United States are suicides. And the vast majority of suicide by gun is done by men. And, and by the way, the, I think the fastest growing category of people who kill themselves with firearms is white men over the age of 50. I mean, all of this stuff is connected and, and sophisticated people in the 21st century make these connections. And, and, and again, the connecting point that I think is important to, to, to over, you know, to, that can't be overstated, that has to be said out loud over and over again is how are we defining manhood in such a way that so many boys and men feel like they need to use violence to either, you know, gain or maintain power and control, to establish themselves in a, in a status hierarchy, to, you know, to uh, redeem their manhood, something that's been taken from them. In other words, use violence redemptively, um, you know, like in, a, in a re almost like in a revenge sense. Because by the way, school shootings are often that. They're often, while they might be completely inarticulate on one level, what these men are doing has meaning. These young men often are lashing out back at something, someone, or an institution. In other words, the fact that it's at a school, for example. Is, is instructive. Why don't they go to a mall? Why don't they go to a sports event? They go to a school because the school is often the site where they were degraded, ridiculed, humiliated, shamed, and the violence that they're engaging in. And again, I don't know about specifics like in the Uvalde case, so I'm not referring to a specific case now, but often what they're doing is, is an act of redemptive violence. They're going to retake control. They're going to retake control of the narrative of their life. They're gonna be a man. They're gonna use violence to establish their manhood. And they're often, let me just be honest, they're often killing themselves as well. Cause a lot, of, a lot of young men who do school shootings plan to die in the process. They plan to be either kill themselves or be killed by the police. So the question is what, what, is, what is about their life and their life circumstances that puts them in a space where they feel like ending their life and in the case of school shooters, killing, a whole bunch of other people, including innocent, blameless little kids, and, and, and therefore inflicting pain and suffering, not only on those kids, but on all the people who love them. What, what is going on there? And what, and what are the, the particularly gendered aspects of that? Because again, we wouldn't be having this conversation in the same way if this wasn't about gender, because 50% of the cases, girls would be doing it. And, and we wouldn't have to talk about how, as, as much about how central gender is. So, Dr. Katz, we have a magic wand. How do we fix the root cause of this violence? We increase gender equality and gender justice. We break down artificial hierarchies of power and privilege. Uh, we, um, we, we shift our social and economic and political priorities such that we meet people's human needs. We have early, like to get real specific, we have early intervention when it comes to mental health and 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 human, you know, human needs and families. You, you just see so often the the men who act out the most violently often come from really traumatic backgrounds. I'm not saying it's always a one-to-one -one ratio, but they often come from traumatic families where they've been the victims of themselves of abuse, of neglect. Um, and so you, you, we, we reorder our social and economic and political priorities. That's one way. Another way is we have to have a more robust movement to gain control over the crazy level of guns in our society. And to me, the gun availability, especially the availability of AR-15s and other um, military style uh, semi-automatic weapons um, is, is itself a gender issue. I mean, think about all the, for example, think about all the adult men who 
see themselves as the good guy with a gun who's going to protect the good man with a gun who's going to protect women and children and other men against the bad man with a gun. In other words, think about how much gender informs men who show up at state houses with, you know, armed to the teeth, wearing camouflage uniforms in an urban setting, which by the way, calls attention to them rather than makes them blend in. They're calling attention to themselves as manly men who are here to protect our way of life, to protect our families. And if we don't talk about that as a, as a driving force behind the proliferation of guns in our society, we're kidding ourselves. It's, and it's, by the way, it's not only about racism. I think there's some, some, we have to talk about racism if we're gonna talk about white men's fascination with military style weapons and the, nation, the white nationalist narratives about, you know, about uh, uh, the increasing, you know, racial and ethnic diversity of the country and how that's threatening the, you know, sort of white power or white hegemony or white dominance. Obviously this is an important part of the conversation when we're talking about guns and gun policy. But if we're going to reduce school shootings, I mean, my goodness, if we're going to reduce school shootings, and, and we live in a country with where there are 400 million guns already circulating, we have to figure out ways of restricting access of those guns to, especially to young men who are, you know, fragile, who are volatile, who who have all kinds of emotional, psychological, and other needs that aren't clearly being met. And if an 18-year-old can walk into a you know, a gun store, an 18 year old and buy a gun with almost no sort of background check or, or at least go, go to a gun show and buy a gun with almost no accountability. And, no, and, 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 and then because of the high capacity magazines that are also available can just inflict violence on huge numbers of people. I wanna, I wanna ask the men who see themselves as protectors, are you really protecting? Are you, is it really working that we're protecting our children by arming ourselves to the teeth like this and creating laws that make it so easy for everybody to access guns, including disturbed young men. Are we really doing a good job as protectors? I don't think so. I think we have to have a new understanding of what it means to be a protector. And I think we need more men, I have to be honest, we need more men who are willing to say some of this stuff out loud. Women have been carrying the weight of this conversation forever. And when it comes to people talking honestly about gender, about a whole range of subjects, but certainly when it comes to violence, when it comes to gun violence, there have been men, there have been strong men, but who have talked about this from a progressive standpoint, but it's been mostly women. And I think, I think I've heard a lot of men in response to this uh, Uvalde uh, massacre, a lot of fathers who say they look, in it, look in it their, their, into their kid's eyes and thinking this could be my kid. And when I'm dropping my kid off to school, this could be my kid. And is this the world that those men wanna live in? I think we have to start making this more of a priority on the progressive side of the house. And I think that uh, men, who are you know people who are men have an important role to play in that not just as parents but as men in a culture where cultural attitudes and beliefs about manhood are implicated as a big part of the problem mm -hmm. so you are one of these men you've been doing this work for decades uh and it feels like you keep kind of shouting into the abyss um what is something that someone watching this can do right now, uh, just an everyday person who wants to live in the different world that you've described, a world where we don't have to look into our kids' eyes and think, is my kid next? Well, I think we need to, we, we need to elect you know, representatives at all levels of government who are gonna put the needs of people to live free of the potential of violence, including children to live free of, the, uh, free of violence as one of their priorities. I think we need to put into office political candidates at all levels who are going to fund, you know, healthcare, pro, you know, healthcare and, 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 and met, you know, medical and emotional and psychological care and, and programs in the schools and programs in the prisons and the juvenile justice halls. I mean, we have tons of money in this country. We have tons of resources, it's, but, the, but the resources aren't going to where they need to be going in many instances. And I think if we have a democracy, if we have a democracy that's worth saving, it means putting into place representatives who are gonna actually, you know, pass budgets that actually prioritize those kinds of human needs. And if we don't, then we're just, you know, we're just whistling past the graveyard because I mean, what's gonna, nothing's gonna really change as long as we continue to, uh, you know, um, to elect, you know, conservatives and, and, and MAGA Republicans who don't care about any of this and who, and who in fact think it's a good thing that we have so many guns on the streets and, and, and easily available. 
Um, so I would say that one thing is to get involved politically in some way and support candidates for office that will pr pr pursue sane gun policy. Um, that's one thing. I think on an, you know, on an interpersonal level, I think we should think about what our sphere of influence is. Those of us who are adults, who have been some influence in the lives of young men and young boys. Of, of course, young girls and young women and people who are non-binary, I understand. I'm focusing on the men for the moment and young men. Um, I think we who are adults who have influence in the lives of men and young men need to say to them whenever possible that, that there's ways of you know, gaining respect, there's ways of being strong, there's ways of being a good person, a person of integrity that don't in any way involve violence, that don't in any way involve violating another person's integrity, bodily integrity, sexual integrity, that you don't need a big gun, you know, you don't need a, you know, to, 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 to um, uh, you know, prove your dominance over others through force or the threat of force as the only way that you think about what it means to be a strong man, but that things like moral courage, and social courage and having the courage and strength to, to speak up when your friend tells a, a joke about rape or something or makes a dis demeaning comment about women or men it's saying hey dude that's not funny that you know that's not that's not cool i think we need more men and young men who have the courage to do that i think we have we need more men and young men who have the courage to stand with women in in particular in the battered women's movement and the movements against sexual violence and sexual harassment because women in a multiracial multi-ethnic sense have been you know, beating this drum for decades. They've been giving us insight into all these dynamics for decades. They often do it, however, without a whole lot of active support from men. I mean, there is some, there, you know, there have been men who have been supportive and who have been part of the work, no doubt about it, but we need more men who are willing to join those women. And so I think if you're a man and you're in a position to, to support women's um, advocacy, her le leadership, uh, whether it's politically or within institutions, I need, you need to speak up. You know, it, being silent in the back of the room and just whispering in a woman's ear that you support them, that's good, but it's not enough. We need men who are willing to say this stuff publicly. And by the way, if you're an adult man and you have a influence in the lives of young men, and it could be, again, it could be a father, it could be an uncle, it could be a, a older brother, it could be a coach, it could be a teacher, a Sunday school teacher, it could be any number of situations where adult men have influence with boys and young men. I think we need to create some space and say to those young men that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be human. It's okay to experience a range of emotions. You don't have it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. And I think adult men often want to present ourselves to young men as like, we've got it all figured out and you don't want to show that there might be some weakness underneath the, you know, the, the, the tough guy exterior. But I, I think that's doing them a disservice. I think we need to say, even adult men, that you know we're struggling too. We, we have problems too. We're trying to figure this out. We don't get it all going on. And it's like, yeah, we can put on a tough guy face. We can do our job. We can be professionals. We can be capable adults. But we're also underneath vulnerable human beings. And I think adult, excuse me, young men need to hear this, especially in a culture where they're so routinely exposed in media, in porn culture, in you know, in Hollywood films, and you know, uh, in um, in sports culture with this sort of hard, you know, hard edged and hard shelled notion of, of manhood. And I, by the way, let me just say in a positive way, there has been some shifts happening generationally. And so there have been, for example, some prominent men, young men, professional athletes and others who have come forward and say, you know, I have depression, I have mental health challenges. I, I might be good at my sport. I might be a successful man in other ways, but it doesn't mean that I don't have panic attacks. It doesn't mean that I'm, you know, and it doesn't mean that I'm a, a bad person or, or less than in some way. It just means that I'm a human being. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that some of the changes that are happening have been positive generationally. I think a lot more young men are more calm uh, or so are more, um, uh, uh, comfort, uh, comfortable with um, with the sort of more gender fluidity and sexual fluidity than previous generations. I think that a lot of more a lot more young men have, have are more organically embedded in friendship networks uh, and work relationships with women and others in ways that older men might struggle with a little bit. Um, so there there has been some shift, and I think there are a lot more parents, adult men who are parents who are more engaged emotionally in the lives of their kids than perhaps my father's and stepfather's generation. So there is some hope on the horizon, but I think we do have a lot of work in front of us. Thank you, Dr. Jackson Katz. Nobody breaks it down like you. Thanks so much, Caroline.